What's up, everybody? Welcome to a very special episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash, and I gotta tell you, we're changing things up a bit this week. Now, due to the fact that I am currently in a band uh, that just released my debut single, Now I Know, you can get that on iTunes and Apple Music and Spotify and all of the like. I actually have been planning and executing a single release industry event here in LA. And because of that, we simply did not have time, or rather, I simply did not have time to record an episode this week. But rather than just go dark, we thought, you know what? It's been a minute since we have given a couple of our Patreon episodes over here. We usually do this you know, twice a year, give you a little taste of what's going on over there on Patreon. I think the last time we did one of these was uh, last November. So, you know, feels like we're due. We're at the seven month mark. Uh, for those who don't know, Patreon is a subscription based service where you pay a monthly subscription fee and we offer four bonus episodes of the show over there a month. We offer a live monthly Q&A, a poll. There's all kinds of things. So uh, again, check it out if you're interested. Patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails. And for now, we're going to give you two of our bonus episodes that we've recorded over the past year. Uh, the first one is Last Call, Episode 78. This originally aired on March 2nd, 2023. And this is, of course, about the documentary I Love You, You Hate Me. I watched this. I had to tell Christy all about it. So we did a mini episode over there of the show. And I know it sounds crazy, but if you didn't know this, there is actually a massive true crime case connected to none other than that purple dinosaur, Barney himself. And let me tell you, the story is a wild ride. So sit back, get your drink, and prepare yourself for Last Call, episode 78, on our Taste of Patreon. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this Last Call episode of True Crime and Cocktails, a Patreon exclusive. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? Oh, I'm back on the icing track. <laughs> the reveal of the spoon. If you're not watching this on YouTube, dear listeners, you need to just, <laughs> just pop over and see that reveal because it was a classic. <laughs> Look, I... I got a, I, I've had a craving for just some frosting. Yeah. And I couldn't get the kind that I wanted. So I just got one the other day when I had to run out before we did a, before we did a brunch. Yeah. On here. And I had just the tiniest bit because you can only have so much before you're like, it's too much. Um, but it's now later in the evening and we just finished recording and I have scrubbed my body raw. Yes. We've it's just recorded so the yeah. the February happy hour of the show, uh, and so there was lots to there was lots to reset before we did this next episode. Um, yes. Now I know you mentioned that the frosting was sweet, but here's yes. the thing. So for my birthday, I don't know if I told you this. They they messed up one of the cakes. So the one cake no that was vanilla, the the filling was supposed to be buttercream with chocolate chips in it, but there was no chocolate chips in it. I still have to make a complaint. The point is, um, I know that that is very sweet, but I feel like the crunch of the chocolate chip might really do something for you. Well, someone did mention like dipping something salty in this, like a pretzel. Oh, that's hot. So you get a crunch, a crunch, but a salty and a sweet. Yeah. And I was like, damn it. I had a bag of pretzels, but then I think I used it during What Christmas a semi-sweet chip. I just don't know if it's going to make it th that much sweeter. I'm really just about the texture, and I don't know why I'm pushing this on you so hard. I can't explain it. Well, it was the cookie dough bar. Yeah. yeah. I set the precedence. I understand. You did. you did. I had so yeah. much shit to do today. I only did half of it, and the whole time, all I wanted to do was bake cupcakes. And I was like, what's that part of my brain? What am I going through right now? Am I nesting? There, there is something uh, supposedly stress-relieving about baking. I believe that. So I think baking possible. and cooking in general for me, because the only times I really do it is when I have time and I sure. love it. It is meditative almost. Like I love making an entire Thanksgiving meal on my own. I don't get overwhelmed. I love doing it. And then people are like, what can I do? And I'm like, I really like doing it, but I also really like doing it alone, like with no one else in the house <laughs> and then come over and enjoy it. But like, you know what I mean? Like it's, there's something that's very kind of like you your space. Yeah. But then you can come enjoy it. It's like trance-like yeah. for me almost. Hey, I like that. 
and I'll do a I'll do a Canadian Thanksgiving, an American Thanksgiving, and a Christmas dinner. That's you know what it is. That's turkey season, October yeah. through December. It is. And look, I'm a fan. Yeah, but the majority usually we don't do a Thanksgiving, and if we do, I mean for sure we only do a one up here. But yeah. if we do it at all, it's like usually not really. And if it's me, um, for just the five of us, I'll I'll roast a chicken. Maybe depends if I'm busy or not. Because see, unlike you, I I don't care for cooking at all. I hate it. See, I don't yeah. want to do it every day. Like I don't want to do it for function. My most of my meals are Postmates or Uber Eats. Like I don't want to do it for for function. But I like doing it when I have the time for it to be like a a task, like a like an activity. You like a fancy meal prep. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, now listen, I feel like we should get into this because I don't know how long this is gonna take. I love that because I love that I have no idea what we're even doing. I'm driving the bu- the bus, dear listeners. And and you should also note we did already record a happy hour. I'm on a lot of cold medication and I'm a half a bottle of wine deep, and I don't want to say that I'm loose and buzzy, but I'm loose and buzzy, baby. Oh, no. Oh, no. I couldn't be happier with what just happened. What? You'll also love this. Uh, is this a February last call, or is this This March? is a this March. Is, this is the first of March. Okay, yep. nice. The first one in March is what I yep. meant to say. I'm barely alive. I'm, I get it. It's fine. We're, get that. we're all doing our best. Um, I, I can't wait. Yes. So I had a couple of different things I was noodling with, but what I have decided is yeah. to bring you, Christy, and to your patrons, a mini episode of the show. hey yeah. yeah. Because I mentioned a documentary on the normal feed of the podcast, and we had so many people reaching out about that documentary that I thought, why don't I talk about it here? So I am going to go through the I Love You, You Hate Me Barney documentary that I watched on Peacock. That's where it was, and I know that a lot of places in the world don't get Peacock. Um, But I'm going to be honest, this is, like, I'm going to go through the whole thing. So if you don't want spoilers, tune away, watch it, and come back. Yeah. Otherwise, this is also, I think, a nice little gift for the people that maybe can't access it. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. I'm going to go through the whole thing. So there you go. Buckle in. I love you. You hate Lee. You hate Lee. I have not even gotten a sentence. Gluggy, gluggy. L-E-E? Jesus. Okay. I love you. You hate me. Trigger warning before we get started. There will be mentions of suicide, um, drug use, and uh, guns. We don't normally give it a trigger warning for guns, but if that's something that triggers you, now you know. There we go. I did not see any of those coming from a Barney documentary. There's a reason why I'm bringing it to the show. Of course. So, in 1988, Cheryl Leach created Barney and Friends. Um, Now, again, the documentary on Peacock is a good watch. It's two one-hour parts. Um, It talks a lot about the vitriol for Barney, which I spoke about on the podcast. But I thought it would be nice if I did a bit of a deep dive. So that's what we're doing. For context, to set us off, off off the top, the vitriol for Barney. Let us take us back to that part in our minds that maybe uh, maybe you weren't alive yet. Maybe you hadn't even been born yet, dear listeners. But to give a little bit of context, um, Bob Singleton, the musical director for Barney, said he got multiple, not only death threats, but threats of dismemberment for his entire family, simply because he had written the music. Guantanamo yeah. Bay, one of the most notorious places in America uh, or, or under American uh, government, where they routinely torture prisoners, um, would use the theme song, I Love You, You Love Me, the Barney theme song. They would play it incessantly on a loop to torture prisoners. <laughs> wow. So also, the man who played Barney, because there was a person who voiced Barney, and there was a person who was the man in the suit. The man in the suit, also, a tantric sex guru. No kidding. 
I mean, there so, was a little extra pep in his step when his little foot went out at the, you know. So again, wow. I'm just letting you know right now. This is kind of setting the stage for what we're we're buckling into. Okay. What and I'll get more into what the mindset was at the time that this was coming out later, but just again to to do some teasers off the top. So Cheryl Leach was living in Allen, Texas, and it was there that she created The Barney Show, Barney and Friends, which became the number one most watched children's television show of its time. She was working as a teacher for seven years before becoming a part of something called DLM, which started stood for Developmental Learning Materials. It was run by a man named Jim Leach. Spoiler alert, they started dating and got married after she started working there. And then in 1986, their son Patrick was born. Cheryl decided at that point that she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, so she left her job at DLM. Um, she was also often labeled as Barney's mom, which is going to come into play more later. Um, so she described her son Patrick as a very active two-year-old. She said she was always looking for things that would keep him busy. His babysitter, one of his babysitters, described him as, quote, super high energy, always wanting to go from one activity to the next. Cheryl felt that there wasn't a lot on the market at the time that could hold the attention of a two-year-old. Nowadays, I think it's ironic that people often won't let two-year-olds have any screen time. They won't let them watch anything. But at that time, people were begging for anything to put on the, the tube to uh, have their kids engaged, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, Baby Einstein was huge. That's right. People loved it. I never used it, but people loved it. People loved it. Yeah. So, and listen, no judgment either way. Whatever is right for you and your family is, uh, bless you. And that's, I support all of you in whatever your endeavors are. Um, of course. So there was, of course, Nick Jr., the Nickelodeon spinoff, PBS. And there was kids blocks on major networks, which primarily were Saturday morning cartoons and whatnot. But that was it. So it did feel like there was maybe a hole also for toddlers. So again, there, oh, a lot of the yeah, kids yeah. shows were geared at kids who are a little bit older. And I do think that there is something interesting when we think about our generation specifically, because we were probably as little kids watching a lot of content that was meant for kids who are older than us. Oh, and I yeah. think that that speaks to how older millennials are just completely dead inside. I grew up on Mannequin and Grease too. <laughs> totally. There is a reason I am the way that I am. But I also, listen, this is my point, because I started thinking about it and I was like, I used to watch G.I. Joe, I used to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like all these shows yeah. that were like fighting and all those things when I was very young. And I watched a lot of other stuff too, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just interesting because I think her point at the time, which I think is actually very altruistic and beautiful, was why don't we just create something that's geared towards very young children that's just about spreading the message of love. That's yes. it. There's no other layer. I think that's a really lovely thing. Yes. So at the time, Cheryl rented a video called We Sing Together. And boy, oh boy, did it sound annoying. But that's not the point. That's not the point. And I shouldn't be throwing shade because this is, I'm about to get, get, get on people for throwing shade. But this is what I'll also say as a caveat. Yeah. It sounded annoying to me as a concept, but I'm not going to then start to yell at other people who like it. If you like it, great. Good I don't you. care. Yeah. And that's the difference between me and the people we're about going to talk about in a little bit. But anyway, her son, Patrick, loved it. The premise was that a stuffed mouse and a stuffed bear would come to life at night and Patrick would play it over and over and over again. So Cheryl thought, what about something like this that would hold the attention of a child like Patrick? So look, I want to say this right off the top. I think that Cheryl Leach did an amazing job creating this show Again, I think her intentions were truly pure, that she really, really did just want people to have this message of love spread and, and something that was geared towards little kids that didn't really exist at the time. However, I have to call this out because it wasn't in the documentary and she also wasn't a part of the documentary. So at first I was like, well, maybe they didn't really touch on this because she's like affiliated with it, but she wasn't, she wasn't interviewed. She was no part of it. So I don't know why they didn't connect the dots that I did, which were, she was a stay at home mom at the time, of course. Um, but she would kind of, when she was doing press because Barney blew up so big, spoiler alert, that's the next part we're going to get to. Of course, She would do interviews where she would say that she like, didn't have a background in video. She had no experience. She was just a stay at home mom. 
But let's also remember that she met her husband working for something called developmental learning materials, right? Mm. And then it comes out that her father-in-law, Dick Leach, owned a video production studio. So she just pitched the idea to him and he said, yeah, great. I have, I have the means and the access to do this. Let's make a show. So I'm not trying to negate her, like, tenacity, chutzpah, all of the above. I, I still think she has it. But it's just yeah. interesting to me that it was really positioned like it was like, I'm just a stay-at-home mom who randomly had this idea. And it's a rags to riches story. And it's like, well, you also had a lot of kind of means and connection and those right. kinds of things. It wasn't like she was a woman who out of absolutely nowhere pitched a TV show to a TV network and somehow, you know what I mean? Like she got right. it made because it was her father-in-law. But anyway, doesn't negate that it was a great product. So um, one of the writers on the show said that he, so he was hired right at the beginning and he said he thought the character of Barney should be like the Bruce Willis character in Moonlighting, which for context was like kind of like a wisecracking, smartass type character. Okay. That writer was fired and got a letter <laughs> which said, quote, you have a creative spirit that cannot be contained. And I just want to say that's the nicest way I've ever heard of anyone getting fired from a creative job. I, kudos. Yeah. So... At first, when the Barney show took off, Patrick, Cheryl's son, apparently loved Barney. Obviously, Patrick was the entire reason that Barney even existed. Sure. Um, but that would come to change over time. More on that later. The big thing was there was no marketing budget. So while I will say that she did have the, the connection to actually make the show, I, what I will also say in her credit was there was absolutely no money to market the show. And this is where I say Cheryl really shone, and I have a lot of respect for her. What she decided to do was hire a group of her mom friends. They would call them the mom blitzers. And basically their job was just to call other moms and spread the word about these videotapes. They would also go to schools and daycares and bring copies of the tapes and, and approach people and say, hey, have you seen Bernie? You should watch it. It's great. And I love this, the women helping women aspect, the yeah. fact that it was like everybody was trying to help everybody make money and get ahead. I think that's awesome. And again, I uh, in no way want to say anything negative about her. I just thought it was interesting that the documentary never pointed out that it was like, it wasn't exactly like a rags to riches thing is my point. But this is where this is where she does shine. And it, this is a little more rags to riches because again, the tenacity. So one woman named Sloan Coleman, rented the tapes, and upon watching said, oh, I need to do Barney birthday parties. So she somehow just gets Cheryl's office number. Again, I love the tenacity. And was like, this is what I want to do. Cheryl was like, sounds good. So they go into business together. Sloan says at that point, she became the senior vice president of live events and stage show productions and was employee number six. So while there was, wow. you know, it was very small at this point is the is is the whole thing. The first live show was in Texas and it completely sold out. Now keep in mind at this point this is just videotapes. So they've made the copies of tapes, they've spread them around to their friends, they've put them in video rental places in Texas and then it was like this is how much it was exploding just on a grassroots level which I think again is commendable. So, at the time a man named David Voss, a mime, was playing Barney in the suit. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, there was always a different person doing the voice. At this time, David, a mime, says that he got a calling to go into the military. Oh, not a judgment, just such a career path of note. Mime work, Barney, military. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. that's... Uh... So you, quit. you quit out of nowhere. Wow. And that's when a little gentleman named David Joyner enters the scene. Um, he was the one, of course, uh, that I may have alluded to before. But uh, the suit was said to have weighed about 60 pounds. It was really, oh. really heavy. And the way he tells the story is he just got the call that was like, hey, we want you to come do this gig that he didn't have to audition, which I'm not questioning him. I'm just telling the story as it was told. Sure. Um, but he 
really moved in the suit. And that was kind of the Barney that we maybe remember. Like you were saying, like you remember like. Oh, I remember his little foot that sits at the end. Yeah. Yep. And so he put it on and he was like, he came alive. He was, he was leaping, doing kicks, doing spins. He did a 360 in the air. And listening to him to talk about it actually is, is really heartwarming. Like it really does feel like he really loved playing the character. He played the character for over 10 years um, and that he really liked what he could bring to it. Now, in 2018, an article came out uh, saying that David Joyner was, of course, a tantric sex guru. But he, of course, says that Tantra is not just about sex. He describes himself as a tantric energy healer. He was studying this as far back as 1990, but he was also dancing, modeling, working as a live mannequin, um, and then, of course, performing as Barney. So he made Barney look downright athletic. This was kind of the physicality Barney became known for. And I have to say, maybe the, the Tantra training is part of what helped him in those, in those moments. Um, when he's asked to describe the work that he does now, his tantric energy healing, he describes it as the following, quote, I help goddesses reconnect with their sexual energy on a spiritual level. He says that the fee that people will pay to him is for the energy work and massage and meditation, but that anything beyond that, there's no extra fee. So then, of course, the documentarian is asking, so beyond that? do you have sex with them? And he says he doesn't necessarily have sex with his clients. Not all of them have a full session. Um, but again, all of what he is describing is... I think his prerogative and legal and all of the above. Um, now I know sex work is not technically legal, but the point is, is that he was, he's saying that he's not receiving an exchange of money for that. If that was to happen and that it's case by case, it's not that it's like people book him for that. It's that it's, you know, case by case basis. Now, of course, when he started working as Barney, he had to sign contracts promising that he would not only not teach Tantra or continue to do that kind of work, but also that he wasn't allowed to practice it himself. And I do have to get my back up a little about that because I understand that we're also talking about the late 80s, early 90s. This sure. is a time where something like that could torpedo a show, um, you know, obviously. But I don't know that it's fair to ask someone that they can't practice something in their private life. Like, I guess they were worried that he would do it with someone and then that person would come forward and then it would turn into a whole scandal. I don't know. I just feel like my heart really broke. And the reason it broke was because when he talks about the work that he's doing, the yeah. ta the tantra, 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 um, he would talk about how he did kind of bring some of it to the work that he did as Barney, but but not in a sexual way. His whole thing is about like embracing energy and whatnot. So he says that when he would put on the Barney suit, he would tap into his kundalini energy and just think love, 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 love. Like that was like the thing that like got him into sure. character or whatever. He has been described as unique, intense. And one person said, maybe not everyone needs to understand David Joyner. But ultimately, everyone that they interviewed did have the same resounding feedback that David was all love, that he trans transmits it everywhere emits it everywhere he goes and that they really feel like that kind of was translated through the suit so again nothing negative no one said anything negative about him just that he was you know a bit of a unique character so obviously he played barney for 10 years in that time he was accused of keeping drugs in the tail of doing drugs on set there was also a rumor that he had hanged himself in the suit and he got a call from his mother, who was then relieved when he answered the phone because the story had got to her that he had attempted to kill himself or had actually succeeded. Um, again, this is pre-internet or very, very early internet. Sure. And obviously these rumors were not true, but it's just the tip of the iceberg when we get into the Barney story. 1991, a man named Larry Rifkin said that his daughter Leora wanted to rent a video on Super Bowl Sunday and they weren't big into football, so he was fine with it. She chose Barney, and he said she wanted to watch it over and over and over, so he sat down to see what exactly was so captivating about this video. He said that the videos he felt were designed to get kids off of the couch and getting interacting and taking part and kind of mimicking what was happening in the video. 
and that it was a less passive viewing experience from other kids' shows that had come before it. Larry said, quote, Barney was Fred Rogers going electric. Wow. Okay. It also so happened that Larry Rifkin was the head of programming at Connecticut Public Television. So after seeing the videos, he got a hold of Cheryl and said they wanted to air it. And that is when it exploded. It ended up being aired in over 215 countries, I believe. Wow. By the time Patrick turned seven, Cheryl described his relationship with Barney as one that had some sibling rivalry. Because as you know, she often talked also about being Barney's mother. This is very interesting to me. Because she spoke often of Barney as though he was a sentient real being that was her other child, as opposed to labeling what the situation was in actuality, which was that Patrick had resentment and rivalry with her career. Sure. She really posed it when she would talk about it as though it was like, well, you know, she would honestly be like, well, you know, Patrick and Barney, there's some like sibling rivalry there. And that to me feels like she was disassociating a little bit, psychologist hat on, where it was like she was making it this other thing as opposed to just owning that she probably felt great guilt that this career had suddenly taken over. She wasn't home as much. And he was resentful of that. She didn't want to take ownership that it was her job. She instead wanted to make it this other being. Right. That's my interpretation. Um, she wanted to disassociate from the responsibility and how that those choices were impacting her son. Obviously, the amount of time she was away was also taking a toll on her marriage to Jim. Um, now, when the show first came out, obviously it was a massive runaway hit. But what slowly started to happen was this hatred of Barney, this hate movement that I kind of alluded to in the episode where I talked about this uh, in the main feed of the of the podcast. And to give a little bit of context, the year at this point was it was around 1993. So the Jerry Springer show was blowing up on television. Um, the grunge music was the biggest trend in music at the time. The movie Pulp Fiction came out in 90, 1994. There was kind of just a darkness and like cynicism to pulp culture at that time, um, which I think is, again, important to remember in terms of like setting the stage for what eventually happened. One of the people who was interviewed in the documentary was um, Steve from Blue's Clues. Oh, and he was so articulate and insightful. He had some like really interesting thoughts and he had a, a thought about the, the time and characters on television at the time. And he said, there was something broken about characters from Sesame Street, like Grover or Bert, as in Bert and Ernie. And he said, that makes us, all of us who have something broken about us, because most people do, feel seen. But there was nothing broken about Barney. And his theory is that that's part of the reason why people hated him so much. Which I actually thought was really interesting because there is something that's like off about a lot of the characters that we loved prior to him. And he was just perfect love, sunshine, all of the above. There was like no cracks, right? Right. It also should be noted the homophobia began at this time. Um, there was often, for some reason, again, and I remember this from back then too, it was like, well, he's purple and that's a gay color. I mean, we all know that... <laughs> There are no colors that are anybody's colors and all of the above. And I don't even know where that came from at the time. Um, but that was a big part of it. It should also be noted, of course, that the AIDS epidemic was rampant during this time. There was so much fear and misinformation being spread about the gay community that it was feeling like another scapegoat uh, for that vitriol. It was at this time that Cheryl's husband, Jim Leach, quit his job to stay home to help support the Barney Corporation however he could. Cheryl and Jim basically reversed their roles. So he was a very successful businessman when they met. She gave up her job to stay home. And then when Barney blew up, she started working and he stayed home with Patrick. But it also should be noted that this was a rarity in the early 90s. I mean, oh. it's still a rarity in some ways now. I know a lot more people do it now. But at that time, not, not a lot of men were giving up their extremely successful careers to stay home with children. No. Um, so enter Rob Curran. His daughter, Michelle Christine, loved Barney. 
He went away on a business trip. I referenced this when we talked about this on the show. Right. And when he came back, Michelle Christine didn't run to him because she was busy watching Barney, transfixed, and he was hurt by that. So he decided to come up with a list of all of the things that annoyed him about Barney and then decided to found a club called T-I-H-B-S-S, which stands for the I Hate Barney Secret Society. <laughs> he referred to them not as a hate group, but as a support group for parents who have Barney addicts in the family. His words. Oh, wow. He said he was just giving a voice to all the fears parents felt about Barney. And all you had to send in was 50 cents to join and get a, a newsletter. Now, I'm not sure if these were weekly or monthly, but they were paper. He says in the first couple of weeks, he got over 7,000 requests. And I'll do the math for you. $3,500. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Which well, doesn't so feel like it's... What's it costing him to send out those newsletters? I think he's breaking even at best. Even at that time. Even with the, with the cost of the envelopes and the, the postage? Come on. Oh, yeah. Now, one thing I do have to address, because I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, is that watching the footage of what then proceeded to start to happen, so many of the people who were really the ones deep into the vitriol, the angriest, the most violent about Barney, were, of course, men. Cisgendered men, I, I think I can say fairly accurately. What started to happen was there was these things called Barney bashing events. They were started by a man named Travis Fox. He said that his character as a kid was Big Bird and he hated that Barney was a replacement to Sesame Street and he needed to push back. He says that Barney bashing was a protest. This is an adult man. He was in college at the time. Over 18. Legally an adult. Also, uh, you learned a lot of things from Big Bird, huh? Because that's what Big Bird would do. Oh, yeah. You see, you see a new friend in the neighborhood? Get the fuck out of here, punk! Like, And literally, at, at these Barney bashing events, they literally would take all these Barney toys and destroy them, beat them with hammers, set them on fire, rip them apart, and it culminated in a wrestling match, which was somebody dressed as Barney and somebody dressed as Big Bird. This man's love of Big Bird is, I think, the more of the, like, headline news. Do you know let's what I mean? In, like, let's look a little deeper into that, Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox. Um, so again, the video footage that they showed of people destroying the Barney toys, it is mostly men. There's a few women there, but of the people doing the actual violence, I didn't see all of the footage, but I'm saying what was provided. And that was never talked about in the documentary either. Um, they did get into kind of like the traditional gender things, which I'll talk about in a bit, but I just thought that was interesting. The women that were interviewed were often like, my husband hates Barney. And I think it's just so interesting that it was like women just have a tolerance. They also you know, stereotypically were primarily the caregivers. And I think they probably saw Barney as somebody who was giving them a break during, you know, child care times. And sure. it's so interesting to me that these men who probably, again, I'm making generalizations, but given the time period, sure. probably weren't primary caregivers, were probably more of going to work. Why do you care? Who cares? Yeah. Yeah, there. Oh, I, I understand uh, being annoyed with a show that your kid watches. Sure. I absolutely understand that. Um, but there has never been a show that my children have watched that has made me so angry that I'm going to start a hate group or like that I'm going to destroy toys of that no. show because I'm so angry. It's like, do they love it? Yeah. Do I have to? No. I can and there was people the who would be like, well, you can't even watch it with your kids. It's it's just made for meant for 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 toddlers. And it's like, yeah, it was meant for toddlers. That's the whole point. Yes. Not everything has to be about you, sir. Well. So back to Rob Curran. You remember the one that started the newsletter? He referred to himself, and I am quoting him here. And he he said this, I believe, current day. That he was an opinion leader. <laughs> I can't. No. I can't. No. He said there was resentment in families because families were being held hostage by Barney. 
it's I think I don't need to point it out here, but it just feels like jealousy. It feels like their People kids are love Barney. So pissed. Yes. They didn't come up with the idea themselves. Because here's the alternative question to me, Mr. Curran. Did you really want to spend every waking moment interacting with your child? Because if you did, I'll eat my own hat. I will tip my hat to you that you were interested in being completely engaged in your child 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But we both know that that's not true. Right? Yeah. So therefore, to me, it's like, it's just so clear that this is only about the jealousy that the child likes the character more than they seemingly like you in a moment. I just don't think that it's altruistic. Because also, by the way, if that was the case, they probably wouldn't have been watching the video to begin with. You probably would have just been interacting with them and spending that time with them and not putting on the TV to begin with. And I'm not judging anyone who puts on the TV for children. I'm just sure. saying that it's like, if you were someone who it was like, it's important for me to be interacting with my child at all times. Sure. Right? Yeah. Give me a break. Is my And I know parents like that. Angels. They wouldn't be in this position because they wouldn't have put it on in the first place, is my point. So Sure. There's also a theory that comes up in the documentary that perhaps for many men, seeing a male character being so loving made them feel especially upset that their childhoods personally weren't like that. Um, or that they didn't feel like they could express their own feelings. And Barney was able to do that. Barney was a male character who was very loving and was expressive of, of all kinds of positive feelings. And there is the theory that perhaps seeing this made them resentful and angry about their own childhood, that they didn't have a character like that, that they didn't have someone like that in their own lives. I think that there's probably a lot of truth to that. Sure. Rob Curran goes on to say, and I quote, Nothing feels more stimulating than nursing a giant grudge. Sir, you are an adult man, and you started a hate newsletter about a children's television show character. Yeah. I think we have different, different, different definitions of what stimulating is, but I digress. So, Patrick's former babysitter, who I referenced earlier, her name is Lori Went, and she said, quote, he never stood out as a troubled little boy. But as she was giving this, I was going to say testimony, but it, it's not a court case. It, it was just on, on camera for the documentary. Interview. Sure. Thank you. That's it. Her eyes kept darting to the left. And I know that we've heard in the past that this was a sign of someone lying or showing deceit. But I dug into it. And that has actually been debunked. There were some studies that were done in 2012, which debunked that eye movement could unequivocally denote lying. However, that said, in the documentary, this woman was interviewed again two months later and did admit that she was being dishonest at the time that she gave that first interview. So I also feel like while we can't say that unequivocally approves lying, with this woman, sure. it was just very obvious. She was like, I never, I've never... Like, it was so much oh, head-turning, oh, eye movement. But she went on to say that she didn't want to be unkind. Um, she said that she didn't want to hurt Cheryl in any way, but then did go on to say she wasn't super surprised that Patrick had gotten into trouble. Oh. She described him again as a child as being super active and that he would test his limits. If he was told not to run carrying a glass, he would say, but what if I do? And would do it. He said, she said that she got the feeling that Cheryl was concerned about Patrick when the real hate towards Barney got intense. Um, it was during that time when she was babysitting that Cheryl would be very like, please don't let him out of your sight. Like, I think she was genuinely very concerned sure. for his safety and all of the above. Now, Bob Singleton, who of course was the musical director I referenced earlier, found out about the Barney bashing when he was nominated for a Grammy and he did a radio show, like, like a press tour, basically, like promoting that. Sure. He had been nominated for a Grammy. And almost everyone who called in just wanted to tell the, tell him how much they hated him. He said he was living in fear. He said that it was the worst time in his life. He said he could he didn't even get into all of the details from that time because it's so triggering and upsetting to him. Wow. And to that I say, this man who has reached an amazing milestone, being nominated for a Grammy, what a wonderful life moment. And I also say, fuck you to that radio station because they screen those calls. And it's more than possible that some people called up and said they were going to be positive, but when they got on the air were negative. I'll sure. add in that factor. 
But if they put anybody being hateful to him in the queue to talk to him, that's brutal. This man is like, again, like, I just hate it so much. Like, it makes me so angry. Like, there's so much in this documentary that it's like the antithesis of everything that we are all about, which is like, if it brings you joy, do it. If it makes you happy, do it. Like, who cares? And it's like, it's so interesting that this this one character in pop culture just caused such a stir with people in a like in the worst possible way. One man, Sean Breen, who describes himself as, and I quote, not nice, rude, loud, says that he was in the 10th grade when he found something called the Jihad to Kill Barney on the internet. It was started by a group of college students. He went on later to work for the Jihad to Kill Barney. Uh, and they turned it eventually into a role-playing game, like a Dungeons & Dragons type thing. Oh, sure. Um, he said, and I quote, on the internet, we were the rebels. We were fighting against conforming like the normies. Here's the thing is, Barney wasn't targeted to you guys. You're talking college. You're talking mid-high school. Like, conforming to the normies, you mean the two- to four-year-olds that were consuming the content that was appropriately made for them stop being a normie why do you care yeah so it was around this time that cheryl had had enough and there was lawyers that did get involved they did send cease and desists to the jihad to kill bernie turned into a whole thing um there was another situation too where there was this baseball mascot this san diego chicken and he would have a person dressed as Barney come out onto the field during games and they would get into a fist fight. He also got sued, but then it turned out under parody law, he was protected. So he managed to get off and make Cheryl pay his legal fees. Anyway. So wow. Cheryl said that the Barney bashing felt like they were bashing her child. I.e. because she said yeah. Barney was her child. It was taking a toll on the family. In 1998, Cheryl decided she needed to leave the Barney and Friends show. Many felt, felt that the show was never the same once she left. Everyone really loved her. Everyone who worked with her had glowing things to say and that they really felt like she was kind of like the heart and soul of the show. In that same year, Cheryl and her husband, Jim, did separate and their divorce would later be finalized in 2001, three years later. The man who did the voice of Barney from 1988 to 2000 was a man named Bob West. After Cheryl left, he also left and was replaced uh, by a man named Dean Went and David Joyner, of course, the tantric man in the suit also left shortly after that. And a gentleman named Carrie Stinson took over for him. It was later um, in that time period. I, I'm, I'm blanking on what the exact year was. I didn't write it down, but uh, the show was sold for $275 million to a huge media company. And that's when they started to kind of the new company started to mess with the concept a little bit. They wanted to add conflict to the stories. So there was like more of like a teaching element, which had never really been in there before. They also added a character named Riff, who is a saxophone playing orange dinosaur. They used the terms urban and hip hop in describing the character, which is as problematic as it sounds. Yeah. Um, of course, at that point, there was the baby Bob character that had already been added, but that was prior to this. Oh, this was after God. that. And there was also I the yellow one her. whose name I'm blanking on. This was after all of them is the point. Oh, wow. Finally, in 2010, Barney and Friends was canceled. But what a run. 22 years. So jumping back for a second. 2001, Patrick, Cheryl, and Jim's son was 16. At this time, Cheryl was interviewed by Katie Couric. And she did say that Patrick's friends did bully him about his connection to Barney. So after the divorce went through, Cheryl started spending a lot of her time with Patrick in Turks and Caicos. She opened a restaurant there. Patrick helped out in that restaurant working there until eventually they did move back to California, specifically Malibu. Sorry, I, I just read a note that it actually needs to go later and you'll understand why I'm laughing when I get there. I got ahead of myself in my notes. So in 2013, Patrick was 27 years old, living in Malibu with his fiance and two children. It was described that Patrick was living in a house that was a mansion. 
and that there was a more modest house next door where a man who was 49 years old named Eric Shanks lived with his elderly mother. Patrick and Eric routinely had disagreements. At times, Eric was known to just start to shout onto Patrick's property. And it seems that they kind of shared a driveway. Like you had to go up a driveway to get to Eric's house, or you could turn off to go to Patrick's house. So the morning of January 9th, 2013, Eric was walking up his driveway towards his own home as he passed Patrick. There was a sign on Patrick's gate that said no trespassing and a security camera. Eric apparently walked up to the sign, read it, and then kept walking. Patrick saw this on the security camera and felt rage, got in his car, drove up the driveway to Eric's house, and confronted him. A huge argument ensued. Patrick said, stop coming onto my property. Eric said, well, you're on my property now. Eric then turned to walk back into his house, but turned back to see Patrick with a gun that was aimed at Eric. Eric said, and this is his own testimony, quote, really? A gun? Are you going to shoot me? And before he could even finish that sentence, Patrick did shoot him. No fewer than five times. Oh my God. Five shots. He shot Eric in the chest. One bullet went through his chest and came out of his shoulder. Patrick then essentially left him to die and sped down the Pacific Coast Highway, or as we call it here in LA, the PCH. He was later pulled over and they found a loaded handgun, a rifle, and noticed that he was wearing a bulletproof vest. Interesting. So, Eric Shanks was found by someone somehow and did survive the attack. Wow. Yes. Um, But it should be noted that, of course, he would routinely yell things at Patrick's house, and Patrick was described at this time as being, quote, paranoid and tightly wound. Now, we know that Patrick grew up in the shadow of Barney, but were there any other factors that could have led him to try to kill? Buckle in. So Cheryl and Jim split when Patrick was 14 and then divorced three years later. During that time, Patrick developed a brain tumor that had to be surgically removed. Now, it was benign, and I haven't been able to find out what part of the brain it was in, but I don't need to tell you. Of course, I have talked many times on the show about how there is the frontal lobe trauma in virtually every serial killer um, that has ever been tested. Every serial killer where they tested the brain, it was there, I should state. Sure. There was many whose brains hadn't been tested. But after he had that, so again, he was 14 when they divorced. Three years later, sorry, he was 14 when they split. They divorced three years later. And then it, it just said somewhere in that time, he developed this brain tumor, which had to be removed. And then when Patrick was 18, Unfortunately, his father, Jim, did take his own life. Wow. Okay. So Patrick says that he had become addicted to marijuana as a way of medicating himself, but that it had, it had unfortunately amped up his paranoia. He went on to plead no contest to assault with a deadly weapon because Eric, as I said, did survive. And on July 1st, 2015, Patrick was sentenced to state prison for 15 years. However, the state governor commuted his sentence so he was released after five years he is as as the at the time of the documentary he is now married to his fiance that he was with at that time and they do live together with their two children now a couple things yeah a couple footnotes one throughout this documentary there was a woman who was interviewed and it had her name at the bottom of the screen in the little you know print and she right. was kind of cited as being an anti-hate activist. Sure. Wonderful. At the end of the documentary, they have a clip where she introduces herself, and I'd just like to read for you how she introduces herself. Please. I'm Shannon Foley Martinez. I'm a former neo-Nazi, white supremacist, who now works to help people leave those spaces and set up prevention models so they don't get into those spaces to begin with. And I was oh. like, I didn't see that coming. I love that they left it till the end. It was such a brilliant choice, I thought, on the on the part of the documentarians that it was like, she is an anti-hate activist. They credited yeah. her correctly. But they were like, we're not going to tell you off the top. Because if we tell you off the top that she was a former neo-Nazi, it's probably going to taint how you think about her and what her sure. things that she's sharing um, 
how we may perceive them because it definitely changed the lens for me. Right. Sure. But she was basically going on to say that when you base your entire personality around what you hate, it's the same concept as white supremacy. And I was like, that is a really good point. It's like, if you are literally making your entire orbit, your entire universe be about things that you hate and sitting in that hate, it is, it is the exact same basis of a hate group. Also, Rob Curran, the man who started the hate newsletter, you'll remember. Yeah. Well, at the end of the documentary, he comes out and says, it was difficult for him to speak about all of this in the documentary, that he was feeling some PTSD. And then he reveals that he's been in recovery for alcohol issues. He said he was losing control of his life and hating Barney helped him feel like he was maintaining some control in his life. As of now, he says he's been in recovery for 30 years. And ultimately he says he's grateful for what Barney did for him because it allowed Rob to examine his own personal character flaws and so on. So I love that this man who was struggling with substance issues yeah. took that addiction, for lack of a better term, and just Traded put it, it into in. being addicted. Because when he talked about how it was like the greatest feeling is having a grudge, I was like, that's such an odd thing to say, but now it makes complete sense. Yeah. Oh boy. Also, now hold on. I got to go back to that note that I had left. Uh, I put it the wrong point. I'd like to offer exhibit A, and that is Charles Middlestad, criminal defense lawyer, Patrick's lawyer. I'm sorry, he can get it. Also, on that note, Mm -hmm. I found Steve from Blues Coos to be ex extremely insightful, hella articulate, and also can get it. Wow. Yep. Yeah, Reporting look. for True Crime and Cocktails, <laughs> I'm on Creek Creek. Yes. Now, I'm assuming based on the time frame of Blues Clues, you never... No, I never saw it. Because it was... Yes. Um... Um, uh, I, uh, one of mine, I think, oh, I think my middle one got super, super into it when he was really little. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, my niece watched Blue's Clues from the start and was obsessed. When Steve left, he, you know, went to college which was <laughs> what they said right devastated of course and then they bring in joe played by the very handsome donovan Patton. um so person. cute like visually i was like fuck yeah they finally got someone who was right up blanche's alley but he wasn't the same it just didn't feel the same and it mm. made me sad and then when my kid got into it, um, I refused to show him episodes that had Joe in it because it was, if you're doing Blue's Clues, you do, it's Steve. Steve's the OG. Yeah. And I hope that Steve left because he wanted to and not because he was pushed out in any way because devastated. I've also heard so many lovely things about Steve from Blue's Clues. Um like there was a story once of he was driving somewhere and he happened to have a bunch of like merch from the show in his car and he saw like balloons and stuff that was like, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday party this way. And they had like the Blue Clue paw print on it. And he was like, well, I mean, so he went to the, he followed it, went to the party, brought in a bunch of the merch and like changed into the shirt to show up and was like, hey, it's my friends. And oh, not a dry he, eye. He can get it. He can get it. It's beautiful. He's like, how tall do you think he is? You think he's like little Spider-Man? Oh, 100%. Yes. I, I think see. five, six would be stretching it. He's my short king. Oh, I really I fell that. in love with him in this documentary. The, they they hey. ended on this speech that he gave that was so poignant and so like, 
again, I just keep using the word articulate. Like he just was like, he articulated sure. it so well where he was basically like, and I'm going to bastardize it now as I try and regurgitate it and I'm drunk. But he basically said, he was like, you know, what's, what was your character? You know, and then they ask a bunch of the other talking heads in the documentary to say like who their favorite character was. And he was like, yeah, okay. So then imagine finding out that your character was getting beaten up in these rallies that were being held because people hated it. He goes, it probably yeah. would feel pretty awful for you, wouldn't it? And he goes, and again, this is a paraphrase, but he said something along the lines of, he's like, it's not that I'm saying that everyone has to like Barney or everyone has to like the characters, but he's like, but I do think that it deserves some respect. And I was like, that is the most, like the best way of putting it, where it's like every child that exists had someone had some character for them as a kid. Even if you couldn't watch TV, you weren't allowed whatever, like there was some character from a book or whatever. There was something that you had that was so special to you. And it's from such an innocent, beautiful time. Sure. And for some kids, that may be all they have. They may they may come from situations where their families are, are going through things. And that may be somebody that's like a real kind of um, touchstone for them. And the idea sure. that someone would kind of defile that, I agree with him. I'm like, I do think it's almost sacred. It's like, you just, we just don't need to shit on these pinnacles of characters that are like beloved by so many kids because he was. Sure. Yes. Um, did a quick uh, Google. Steve, AKA Mr. Steve Burns, mm -hmm. five, six. And he's, that probably means five, four. In this industry, people He's, like, he and seems listen, very short, yes. I am into tall men. I'd yes. fuck the shit out of Steve. I would. I'm just being honest. I really would. He really charmed me. I was like, this guy is like so smart and um, thoughtful, like in his, in how he spoke. I'm ready Good to receive. You, Steve. Good for you. We Come should on. look into that. Um, also, I cannot let this end without me saying it because I don't know if it was on purpose or not. Thank you for wearing purple on a Barney episode. Yeah, I thought that was nice. That is nice. We're taking, I, I like mean, it. again, like I hated that he was, I mean, listen, the, the whole documentary, if you want to rage, go, go check it out. It's, it's a good documentary, but also like, it's just, and I remember that. Do you remember that from back then? I remember the, like people hating Barney. Yeah. And that like child, like, like schoolyard, like, um, Barney Barney's gay and stuff like that which by the way oh, is oh yeah I, such do a... recall, I recall that kind of thing yes yeah um, now are they bringing Barney back or what's this new garbage I'm seeing I had not heard that was not a part of the documentary if they are uh, and the documentary came out this seconds. year I'm going to not everything needs to be brought back no Nope. No. Here's what I'm going to say, though. I wonder how Cheryl's doing. Oh, sure. You know, I do feel for her because ultimately, again, I'm not saying anything negative about her. It was just to me interesting that no one connected the dots that it was like, well, she didn't exactly. She had some she had some connections anyway. Sure. That aside, she did build an empire and that takes a very special person to do. And I do feel for her that she built this empire and then you know, her, she went through the divorce, her child got a brain tumor, her ex-husband yeah. took his own life, her child then went on to attempt to take a life. That's a lot. And what a, what a, what a horrific blowback for a woman who just had some, some career success. Yes. Um, I just want you to know, Steve is on Instagram, uh, 326,000 followers. Mm-hmm. So that's What's the name on there. Uh, Steve Burns Alive. Oh, yeah, because there was a there was a whole he talked about it in the documentary, too, that, that people were saying that he had died. And he was like, I wasn't yeah. dead. That's so messed up. Yeah. His cr most recent photo is a picture of him with LeVar Burton. So I'll just immediately start following him. Uh, yes. I like that uh, his. Oh, I guess it's like, oh, you, suggested for you, Donovan Patton. <laughs> and you're like, no, thanks. Yeah, it's like, yeah, no, and oh, and blue now being like 3D and stuff. It's just not the same. Again, I like things to just stay where they are. But uh, Steve leaving was, was difficult. It was difficult to handle. 
I mean, listen, hot as hell. Yeah. Well, I'm probably going to end up sending you like one of his little rants. Of course. Because you'll see what I'm talking about. Well, if you're going to talk to somebody in the that was in like child entertainment, you go with freaking Steve from Blue's Clues. <laughs> right. Like, makes sense. Yeah. If he doesn't own a dog named Blue, I will be sad. But I'll accept it. Yeah. yeah. He's also a musician. Hey, so am I. <laughs> you are. You darn well are. And I'm sitting here every once in a while. I like will touch my skin and I'm like, God, why? I have like patches of sticky because I was just wearing a beard for a different episode. Um, and it's it's not pleasant. I didn't think to scrub that off. Well, and I wish I had. Listen, we come about it honestly. Yeah. Come about it yeah. honestly. Well, listen, thank you so much to your listeners for joining us on this mini episode, which for most podcasts is a full episode. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, it's only like 45 minutes of content. That's not enough. Anyway, um, we hope you enjoyed. Uh, as always, we thank you so much for being here on Patreon. Your support here allows us to continue to make the Creep Creek, batshit crazy content that we love to. And we're so glad that you enjoy it too. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Steve. Yeah, good night, Steve. I'd like to see you naked. <laughs> Welcome back to this Taste of Patreon episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We hope you enjoyed that last episode. Again, I gotta stress this. If you haven't seen that documentary and you have access to it, it's worth a view. It was fascinating. Uh, the next thing we're going to offer to you is something very special. Now, there is all kinds of content jammed into this episode, but the main focus is a little brainchild of young Christy Oxborough's that, of course, she is entitled True Crime Movie Time. Now, what exactly does that entail? I'm going to tell you. She found not one, but three movies that were based on real-life true crime stories and then she researched not only the movies, but then the real crimes that these movies were based on so that she can tell us how accurate they were to the facts, to the cases, to all of the above. Great example. The first movie she does is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's called I Love You to Death. It is probably one of the darkest comedies you will ever see. Tracy Ullman, Kevin Kline, River Phoenix, Keanu Reeves. It is just so worth watching. Uh, but again... A very dark tale that I thought was fiction. Turns out, no, based on a real story. So not only did I have no idea about that, but then also Christy gets into the details again about what was fictionalized, what was kind of, you know, played up or Hollywoodified, if you will. Hollywoodified? Eh, I'll just go with it. Uh, but this is truly such a fascinating episode, and we are so excited to share it with you. So sit back, grab another drink, and enjoy this true crime movie time. Patreon episode here on True Crime and Cocktails. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this happy hour episode of True Crime and Cocktails, a Patreon smammered exclusive. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? Oh, I'm with my best gal. Ready to... Uh... Share a happy hour. I mean, how uh, how much better could I be? I would love to see that, Robert. Uh, it's in my head always. It uh, lives yep. in my head all the time. Like, I will just silently start chuckling to the point where, like, as silent as I can be. Um, but, like, my whole body is moving. And my husband is like, oh, what? Because he thinks it's something I'm scrolling on my phone. It's not. It's because I either hear you singing that or I hear Vanessa, like Vanessa, I never <laughs> met another girl like Vanessa. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the sickness. Um, it, But the joy, the joy that it brings is yeah. so worth any mental breakdown. It might be somehow inadvertently causing. 
Well, what I, it also just seamlessly transitions into this moment, which is the reveal here of, uh, now listen, people have been asking, am I bringing back the ghosties merch from last year, uh, onto the, the, the merch store. And of course the answer is of course, but then, uh, you know, I was like, Oh, maybe something new. And Christy had, uh, the idea for Bert and Larry as ghosts. Wasn't this your idea? I, you know, I know you had a name. Uh, I did suggest it because I thought, but I said, I don't want to give you more work. And you were like, just, just tell me what your idea is. And I was like, we do the ghosts, but as Bert and Larry, and you worked on that in real time while we were still in a Zoom. I was up until I think three or four in the morning doing this because I was obsessed. Uh, And of course it says Boert and scary instead of Bert and Larry. And the details on here, I just think it's some of my finest work. It is. Bert's got a tiny little little ring. He's got a chain. He's got chest hair. Um, Larry's got a bolo tie, a gray mustache, and black yes. hair. Uh, and then, I, I mean, you know, no one's more excited than me that there's now pajama pants in the merch store. Oh. That's a new item. That's a new item that's never been invited, uh, been available before. Uh, so therefore anyone who wants a little extra room, who wasn't into the leggings, guess what? This is your year, babies. Yes. Oh, this is exciting. We have been asked about pajamas. Yes. From the beginning. Day one. So this, oh, thank God. Thank God for it. And I made a mistake and I, I chose black, uh, stitching on this white crop top and I kind of am, am into it. I feel like it kind of works. Yeah, it gives like a, it adds to the extra Halloween feel. It feels a little jazzy. Yes. Look at you. <laughs> anyway. Look, never, never question your work. Thank you. I, again, I, I praise everything that you do because uh, you always amaze me. But this, this is, this is your finest hour. Yeah, it's pretty darn good. It's so funny. Like it was so funny. It was two plus hours of us after as after recording an episode, and possibly after a last call. I already forget, but it was into the wee hours of us just spending hours while while you were creating it. You going okay, and how about now? One second, be like it's not right yet. And it's now, not right. Yeah, it was yeah. really trying to get uh, Bert's hair exactly where it needed to be, course, and I think I got it course. there. Oh, it's. Oh my God, the chain, the tiny, it's the little hands and the tiny ring on the hand. Like it's so funny. It's so cute. And the fact that they came out of just a moment of us being like, we should do, should we do another commercial for season four? And we were like, maybe, what would we do? And then the idea came up of what about like an 80s style? Come on down, you know? And the next thing we know, genius. Bert, Bert and Larry were born. I'd love to see that, Bert. Um, you know what I'm thinking? I was, yeah. of course, because this is this is who I am. Whenever I do, when I get new merch, I yeah. have so many plans to like, I'm going to announce it at a certain time. It's going to be very measured. It's going to be very decided upon. And then yes. I get the merch and I'm like, I want to do it now. That's just who I am. Oh, the second it shows up when it's like the prototype or however we're calling it, yeah. as soon as it shows up, you're like, I'm going to put that on my body and I'm going to get in front of a camera. <laughs> yeah. And I want to put it on yeah. the internet. Yeah. Um, But I'm wondering, because this is coming out Thursday. So then people are going to know about yeah. it. Uh, so the, our Schmammered patrons are going to know about it there. You know what I'm thinking? Do yeah. I shut down the merch store over the weekend from the general public, maybe on the brunch? Oh, and then I'll upload this for then because I don't know if I have time to get it ready, everything ready to go for the general public, but I can shut it down, of course, uh, in our dome of uh, our circle of trust. And then these, yeah. uh, the, the, the Schmammered patrons can have first go at it. I think that feels right. Well, you'll love. I, I was like, I should check my stitch calendar. Oh, uh, and yeah, I don't even know what today is. Doesn't matter. But this episode comes out the 25th and then the brunch is the 28th. So, so you I heard mean, it here first, dear Schmammered patrons, this Sunday at the brunch, or even if you're not at the brunch, I'm going to shut down the store. Stay tuned. I'll post a code, uh, a password, yeah. and you can have first access to the Boert and Scary 
Halloween merch items. I just yeah. couldn't have happier with them. They turned out so well. It's so vibrant. It's just so funny. It was really, I mean, the idea of them as ghosts is so funny to me anyway. But I was like, oh, I wish there were names for them, though. And then I was like, something with like Boo, like Boort. But then I was like, oh, but what do you do with Larry? And then we had like a brief break in between the episode. And she, I think you went somewhere and you were like, I'll be right back. And I texted you. I was like, Boort and scary. There it is. Fuck. I was peeing because we're I really got doing I was, this. Yeah, I was on the toilet and I didn't even wait. I was just like, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh like is july 2022 i guess and august like is the summer of 2022 some of the best ad work i've ever done maybe best ad work yeah you add on fire technically uh uh i need i want five minutes i only need two uh, isn't ads christy that's vile is what that was but the point is i still count it as uh, some of the best thing I've ever said. Um, I'd say, I could say that, that this would be, I think these were your mo your best comedic months. I think they were the, your best improvising months. And I think they were also your madman months. Your madman months. Mad men. Yeah. Months. yeah. I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. I'll take like that it for you. I'd love to see that. <laughs> I can't keep doing it. Um, I will never stop you. Oh, listen. Also, dear listeners, you should know that I edited a clip from that episode, that happy hour, the Bert yep. and Larry happy hour. I edited it and it's just me going, I'd love to see that Bert. And Christy and I will text it to each other periodically, just the clip. And what's amazing is I don't even have to open it. Like, it's like just seeing the the icon, like the, yeah. the, the still, I just go, yeah. I just go. Yeah. And even though you know exactly what it is, you play it anyway. Oh yeah. Every time, at least <laughs> twice. I know, right? <laughs> because you're too busy laughing the first time to properly yep. hear it. So you got to hear it again. Oh, God. Yeah, it's I couldn't be happier that Larry is uh, a musician, yep. a songster. Yep. Um, I I couldn't be happy that that is in his soul. It is. And try to get it out. Just try. <laughs> Um, well, listen, what you got for us? I know you have something prepared. I feel like we should jump right into it. This is a very special happy hour. Uh, well, that and that's the thing. I didn't purposely keep this from you. Uh, I feel like purposeful. I'm- purposeful. I'm going to be honest. There was times <laughs> it felt purposeful. It was. It was just like a- We, we have been talking. Uh, we usually, especially with the happy hour in advance, we'll be like, what are we planning for doing that? What are we yeah. going to- What's our game plan? And we didn't have a game plan for this time but this was a couple of weeks ago and so when it was your week to research i had the week i had i was off from researching right so i was like i got a little bit of downtime maybe i'll find something i can use for the happy hour and i i just stumbled upon it and you know what it's gonna be what it's gonna be it's true crime related that's fun it's pop culture related that's fun. I also could have told you exactly what this was ages ago, instead of just being like, I have something. Well, you did have a little bit of a sparkle when you'd say it, so I didn't want to push it. I I could have easily told you. it. Uh, look, it's because I get to bring up pop culture, and this was some of the funnest research I've ever done. Oh, well, that's so a joy we'll for it. me. Um, <laughs> you'll, love, you'll love how I'm going from that to this. Just a quick disclaimer. <laughs> Ah, yeah, that felt, ooh, that felt um, not right is what that felt. Uh, no, but for real, just there will be a very brief uh, mention of child abuse. So trigger warning for those who need it, because again, this is true crime, but it's also pop culture. So I'm very excited. Okay. So on a previous episode, um, I don't Previously know if it was- Previously on True Crime and Cocktails- yeah, I don't know if it was here, like on in Patreon land, or if it was on the regular feed. But you mentioned the 1990 comedy "I Love You to Death," which is Kevin Klein, Tracy Ullman, and oh, River Phoenix. It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, I watched it recently for the first time. 
I had ne we had never seen it. You mentioned it, and so we made sure to get it. And I just hadn't seen it yet. We saw it uh, shortly before I made this, and then I was like, "Oh, it is based on a real true crime story. Could that be fun to talk about the real true crime story that it was based on?" And then I'm like, "Why stop at one movie?" So I am going to present to you the real crime stories behind three true crime movies in a happy hour that I'm titling True Crime Movie Time. <laughs> Wowzer! Oh, does I it, like that. Okay. Does it need a title? No. Am I a bit extra? Always. <laughs> Always. Oh, I, it's gorgeous. So, I can't wait. And look, I'm going to say it again. So much fun looking for like what's a re like a random movie what's the real story behind it sometimes it's very close sometimes they took some liberties but first up i love you to death oh. now it goes without saying with all three of the movies i am going to mention if you haven't seen them this will contain spoilers yeah yeah so heads up on that um but I Love You to Death came out 32 years ago, so I feel I should be in a safe place yep. to yep. spoil it. Anyhow, so the basic premise, for those who may have forgotten or may not have seen it, uh, Rosalie and Joey, played by Tracy Ullman and Kevin Klein, are a seemingly happy married, happily married couple with two kids running a family-owned pizza place together. What Rosalie doesn't know is that Joey steps out on her every single chance that he gets. When Rosalie finds out, she tries to kill Joey multiple times, including asking an employee, played by River Phoenix, to shoot Joey and hiring two less than bright hitmen to do the job. The hitmen are played by William Hurt and Keanu Reeves. Yes. Despite multiple attempts, Joey survives and Rosalie and the various hitmen are sent to jail. I'm going to say out the gate, I loved the cast, especially Joan Plowright, who plays oh. Rosalie's mother. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all so well cast, except for William Hurt, because I'm team Marley Matlin. For life. Yeah. Uh, for background on what I'm talking about, I believe it's check out episode 70, Sarah Jones, yep. or maybe it was a last call after that Oh, it was Sarah one. Jones. Okay, so it was that one. Okay, well, great. The point is, Team Marley all the way. Yep. So, when I heard this movie was based on a true story, I was, of course, intrigued. And I always assume that they take a lot of liberties. This one was pretty accurate to what oh, really? happened. Yeah. So, the real story involves Francis and Tony Toto. They ran a pizza shop in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and had four children. I don't know specifically when it started, but Tony started having numerous affairs. It got to the point where women were calling the house looking for him. Oh, God. People who knew the family would call Francis to tell her. And according to Francis, quote, a body can only take so much. Yeah. In late January 1983, 39-year-old Francis had someone try to ambush 37-year-old Tony with a baseball bat, but he chased the assailant away. Then Francis tried to make Tony's car explode, but the bomb didn't go off. Francis then had her daughter's boyfriend, 20-year-old Anthony Bruno, shoot Tony with the 25 caliber handgun that Tony kept under his bed. The bullet lodged in Tony's head, but was not fatal. Tony called Francis to his bedside, complaining of a light headache. So Francis force-fed him chicken soup that was laced with sleeping pills. But that, too, seemed to fail. Two days later, Francis hired two friends of Anthony's to finish the job. They were a pair of cousins named Ronald and Donald Barlip. No they, way! They were 19 and 18, respectively. And to think, I thought it was hilarious in the movie that their names rhymed. They were Harlan and Marlon. Yeah. In the movie. Yeah. It turns out their names just legit rhymed in real life, which you can't write that. Like, it's just amazing to me. So Ronald and Donald, Ronald and Donald, there we go, uh, were paid $500 each 
to shoot Tony. The hitmen wanted to aim for the heart, but true to the movie, neither of them could remember which side of the body the heart was located. Uh, so Ronald and Donald recited the Pledge of Allegiance in Tony's bedroom to try and remember which side of the chest the heart was on. They ended up getting it wrong and shooting him um, on the right side, missing Tony's heart by an inch. Somehow, even with a bullet in his chest and another in his head, Tony managed to survive. <laughs> Tony was in bed unattended for four days before an informant tipped off the local police who paid a visit to the house. They found Tony sleeping heavily. Francis, Anthony, Ronald, Donald, and two of the couple's children were arrested. Tony was released from the hospital two weeks later, but the first bullet remained lodged in his skull. Doctors believe the sleeping pills that Francis gave Tony may have actually saved his life by lowering his metabolism and slowing the bleeding. Tony then paid $50,000 bail to get Francis released. He even told the district attorney's office that if called to the stand, he promised to be a hostile witness. <laughs> Francis pleaded guilty to criminal solicitation to commit murder and spent four years in prison. Donald was sentenced to two and a half to five years, while Ronald was sentenced to four to ten years for being the official shooter. Ronald was released nine years later in October 1991 and arrested less than ten hours later. <laughs> he was released at 8.30 a.m. and was arrested at 5.46 p.m. He was charged with possession of cocaine, possession of drug paraphernalia, and public drunkenness. After Francis was released, she and Tony reunited, with Tony swearing he was done cheating for good. The couple went on to live a fairly quiet life, away from the cameras, until the movie came out. They agreed to do press for it. Tony said, quote, the movie is great. It's fantastic. We love it. And it's a message for everybody. Crime doesn't pay. Cheating doesn't pay. <laughs> Francis said, quote, I had so many people call me and tell, I think if more people had minded their own business, we might have been better off. Oh. To which Tony responded, quote, well, maybe not, because I would have kept going and kept going. <laughs> I, I love that he fully openly admits, oh, I would have cheated on you forever. It took you trying to kill me for me to stop is what I love about that. Which feels like it Extreme. shouldn't require that. It feels no. like maybe just don't, but okay. I, you know? Oh, it was... there. This story, like, this feels like a movie, so I get why they wanted to do one. Yeah. But it's like, how is this real? Uh, the couple returned to their quiet life after the movie came out. They only broke their media silence in September 2014 to make a public announcement after the death of Joan Rivers. Apparently, Joan was very nice to them when she interviewed them years before, and they were very fond of her. And I find it hilarious that they were like, you know what? Yeah, the media is going to want to know what we feel about Joan Rivers. Yeah. I'm like, are they? Okay. Uh, from best that I can tell, as of August 2022, Tony and Francis are still living happily as man and wife, and they are now in their late 70s. Wow. Yeah, it's, okay. again, you can't write that kind of story. It just somehow exists. I have to say a couple of things. Yes, of course. My favorite line in the whole movie yeah. is Tracy Ullman is Rosalie, and someone yeah. says, like, Joey's cheating on you. And she's like, that can't be true. And it's like, well, what if it was? And she's like, if Joey was cheating on me, well, I'd kill myself. And if I didn't feel any better, then I'd kill him. I thought that was the funniest line when I was a kid. Sure. Um, my when mom and I, kid. Mother Laurel and I, we used to watch this and eat spaghetti because there that scene where they make the spaghetti, which of course they are poisoning to kill him. Yes. My mouth is watering now, like watching Joan Plowright's character uh, oh, stirring that spaghetti. It just looks so good. <laughs> she said, fresh pepper, a splash of wine. I, I could do the whole thing. Like I, I, it's looks so good. I, I couldn't be happier. Uh, Cause look, I could do, if you give me a little time to write a quick background, I could do an entire episode of me talking about my favorite foods I've seen in TV. <laughs> um, off the top of my head, number one, I want to sit down at the table and hook 
oh. and eat with those lost boys. Of course. And they're digging into that pie. I'm like, what's in that pie? <laughs> what's that taste like? The Is it mostly just like a me, cream pie? Yeah. The top two for me are this, the spaghetti. Yeah. It's it's just burned in there. And then yeah, the other one is just the entire duration of Super Size Me. I know it was supposed to turn us off of McDonald's, but the whole time <laughs> I was like, this looks good. Get me some fries. Again, um, we've been saying for ages, if you give us a chance to do that, we will just, we'll probably drive up their business. Oh, yeah. We'll do the because... same movie, but it'll end up being a positive story. Anyway, uh, and then the other thing I have to say is that yeah. one of the things I realized, but I've never had a, a, any reason to talk about this, yeah, is that I realized one of the reasons why I was I've gotten into crystals, one of the and and all of those kinds of, of things, yes, is because of this movie because River Phoenix's character is into all of these kinds of things and he has his runes. And again, yeah. the other characters like, what do they say? These runes. Uh, and so I always remember that I've bought runes over the years because specifically of learning about the, what they were from that movie. Yeah. Um, this is strength. Again, I could do the whole movie. I haven't seen this one as much as I've seen Clue, but it's probably it's up there. Mrs. Doubtfire, wow. Hook, Clue, and I Love You to Death are probably the four movies I've seen more than any other movies in my life. Wow. I love okay. that movie to death. Oh, hey. Oh, I like that. Um, I have learned for me, uh, oh God, yeah, probably Mrs. Doubtfire because I can quote that. Um, I can recite pretty much the entirety of The Wedding Singer, yep. uh, which I learned the other night because I was like, I haven't seen it in a while. And I put it on and I was doing the whole bits oh, yeah. and I was like this is gonna be irritating for my viewing partner but it's a delight for me but here we um, are um and uh so I married an axe murderer I could watch that and just recite the whole thing it I don't know why that one specifically but yeah I don't know it's I just in it. there yeah well movie number two yeah it's 2011 comedy called Bernie. It stars Jack Black, Matthew McConaughey, and Shirley MacLaine. Huh. Again, spoiler alert, but I feel like we all know at this point. Uh, yeah. In small town in Texas, mortician named Bernie Tita, uh, played by the always charming Jack Black, starts a friendship with a wealthy, mean-spirited widow, played by Shirley MacLaine. Bernie is so beloved by the town that when it's discovered that Bernie may have killed the widow, the town somehow still sides with him. So the real story uh, takes place in Carthage, Texas, approximately 20 miles or 32 kilometers west of the Louisiana state line, which at the time uh, had a, par a population of about 6,500. So on March 22nd, 1990, wealthy banker and oilman Roderick Nugent Sr. passed away at the age of 76. As a funeral director, Bernie did the embalming, but he also helped Roderick's widow pick out the headstone and the coffin. He arranged the flowers. He sang a hymn at the service. He escorted the widow to and from the grave. He offered her his coat when it got cold. Uh, the two ended up starting an unlikely friendship, seeing unlikely because the widow Marjorie Nugent was 74 and Bernie was 31. A few years later, Marjorie insisted that Bernie quit his job to become her business manager, personal assistant, and travel companion. Here we go. They went on cruises together. They did trips to Egypt and Thailand. Bernie became a caretaker for Marjorie, which included grooming, such as clipping her nails and tweezing chin hair oh boy by this point marjorie was estranged from her family so she made bernie the sole heir to her 10 million dollar estate wow in november 1996 marjorie stopped appearing in public bernie gave various excuses as to her whereabouts including poor health and various travel lies then bernie went on a shopping spree of sp sorts spending like five hundred thousand dollars of marjorie's money but he didn't really spend it on himself. Like he donated a bunch of it to the first Methodist church. He bought cars for people in town, 
who needed a vehicle or their vehicle was broke down. So he just bought them a new car. Um, Marjorie's only child, Ron, started to get concerned when he couldn't contact his mother. So in August 1997, he traveled the 523 miles or 880 kilometers northwest from Amarillo to Carthage. Carthage, sorry. Now, I read that Marjorie wasn't in contact with her family, but if Ron was so concerned, why did it take him nine months before traveling there? That was my big thing. But regardless, he gets to Carthage and he has Marjorie declared a missing person. Her house was searched and police were shocked to find Marjorie dead in a freezer. Oh my God. It turns out nine months earlier, on November 19th, 1996, Bernie shot Marjorie four times in the back with a 22 caliber rifle. Then he hit her body in her own freezer in the garage. Oh my God. Bernie was taken into custody where he confessed saying Marjorie had become very hateful, evil and wicked, and very possessive over his life. He even admitted that he fantasized about hitting her over the head with a bat, but chose to shoot her because he didn't want her to suffer. When media went to town after the story broke, townspeople told them that Bernie was the most good-hearted man in town, while Marjorie was, quote, a crotchety old biddy who tended to get on people's nerves. Wow. Yeah. One woman even said if she could get herself on the jury, she would try and make sure that Bernie got acquitted. That's wild. Yeah. So it comes as no surprise uh, that the district attorney, Danny Buck Davidson, asked for a change of venue. Davidson, yeah. who was played by Matthew McConaughey in the 2011 movie, said, quote, I'm not sure I can find 12 citizens in this county willing to convict Bernie. The trial moved approximately 47 miles or 76 kilometers south to San Augustine, Texas. Bernie told the jury he loved Marjorie, but that life with her was, quote, like being in a prison to some degree, being smothered. Despite his initial confession, Bernie claimed he never planned to kill Marjorie and that he had an out-of-body experience watching himself pick up the gun. The jury deliberated for 90 minutes and Bernie was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Bernie appealed and somehow, still guilty, he then just got resentenced to life in prison. So I love that he appealed and it made his sentence worse. <laughs> I just don't, okay. Uh, despite the guilty verdict, supporters outside the courthouse were yelling, we love you, Bernie. Although, not everyone loved Bernie. District Attorney Davidson said, quote, we don't forgive backshooters in Texas, especially someone who backshoots a woman. I didn't know that backshoot was a term. <laughs> it must be. He's a lawyer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, also, oh, uh, I'm going to say it now before I forget. Um, I'm going to uh, send to dear Lauren because she always posts the things on Patreon. I don't know if I, I, I could figure it out eventually, but no I don't need. know how. No My need. point is I've made a couple of side-by-sides of all the real characters side-by-side -side with who they were in the movie. So you can get a real look. It's the McConaughey was such a far stretch of who, like, I, they obviously just wanted a name. They didn't want someone who looked remotely like that man, but it was just, they were like, put, slap a wig on him, slap some glasses. It'll be fine. And it's like, Anyhow, uh, but yes, I will uh, send you some photos that can Thank just get you. Uh, posted just for fun, you know, in this true crime movie time. <laughs> it's a lost. true crime movie time. See, and then you're going to make a song about it. And now I'm going to, now I'm going to want to do this all the time. My favorite so, kind of margarita is lime. I actually put uh, squeeze a fresh lime in my drink for this evening. Just for funsies. Hey, yeah. Fun. I can't stop myself. I decided to treat myself to a lime when I went grocery shopping and showed up and went, 87 cents? Ugh. I bought two. As a you treat. earned it. You deserve it. You deserve it. 
and then my husband and I went and bought a switch and claimed it's for our anniversary. So the yeah. point is, <laughs> yeah, I could, I could splurge on that 87 cent line. Yeah. It's fine. I'm just, it's aggravating to pay that much for something so small. Anyhow. So during his time in prison, Bernie was described as a model prisoner. In an interview, he was asked why he didn't just leave Marjorie if she was so awful, to which Bernie said, quote, oh, no, I couldn't have abandoned her. I was the only friend she had. After the Bernie film was released in 2011, a criminal defense attorney named Jody Cole asked to look through the files of the investigation. She discovered among the items that police had taken from Bernie's house, there were four books on child sexual abuse. Bernie admitted to Cole he had been molested for years by his uncle, something he did not tell his previous lawyer. Cole brought in a forensic psychiatrist to interview Bernie, and he concluded that Bernie's, quote, ability to repress and compartmentalize the abusive events from childhood and adolescence was ultimately overwhelmed by the repeated and extensive psychological abuse he suffered from Marjorie. On that fateful day, in November 1996, Marjorie allegedly made some unpleasant comments about one of Bernie's friends. Bernie lost control and, according to the psychiatrist, experienced a psychological disassociative experience. This new evidence was taken to the psychiatrist who testified against Bernie in the first trial. He conducted a new examination and said he now believed that Bernie experienced that disassociative episode on the day of the murder. A motion for a new hearing was filed. District Attorney Davidson filed an affidavit claiming that if he had known about the childhood abuse, he would have prosecuted Bernie under the sudden passion provision, which would have resulted in a maximum sentence of 20 years. Davidson said, quote, I now feel that a life sentence is inappropriate for Mr. Tita. In May 2014, Bernie's original sentence was set aside and he was allowed to go free on bond until the Court of Appeals decided where they should have a new sentencing trial. At this point, Bernie had been uh, in jail for about 16 years and nine months. When he was allowed out, he moved into the garage apartment behind the home of Richard Linklater, the director of the 2011 Bernie film. Oh, my God. During his time out on bond, Bernie worked for two nonprofit groups to help improve conditions for prison inmates. He joined a men's chorus in Austin, a Methodist church, and dressed up as Santa Claus at Christmas. He also attended therapy once a week and didn't drink or do drugs or break any laws. As with the first trial, the prosecution didn't believe they'd stand a chance with a trial in the county, so the trial was moved 28 miles or 50 sorry, 45 kilometers west to Henderson, Texas. After Marjorie's family filed a motion that Davidson had a conflict of interest, he ended up recusing himself. The new resentencing trial started in April 2016 when Bernie was 57. Uh, when asked what would happen if he was sent back to prison, Bernie said, quote, they might be able to incarcerate my body, but they can't incarcerate my spirit. Hmm. The prosecution claimed that Bernie took advantage of Marjorie, who they suggested was vulnerable and a trusting widow. The defense, however, described Bernie as a victim of abuse who snapped under the pressure of Marjorie's demanding personality. The trial went on for three weeks and included over 80 witnesses, including director Richard Linklater, who took the stand as one of Bernie's biggest supporters, saying he didn't hesitate to let Bernie babysit his two children. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Link later even held a private gala to raise money for Bernie's defense fund. It featured performances by Jack Black and Bernie himself. The prosecution presented witnesses who claimed that Marjorie was actually very shy and nice, while Bernie was manipulative and money hungry. One claimed she overheard Bernie talking to a woman over the phone who was asking for Bernie to return the money she had lent him. This woman was allegedly from Louisiana, where Bernie had lived before moving to Texas. Another witness claimed that Bernie left Louisiana abruptly after some funds went missing from the funeral home he was working for. 
A financial investigator testified that in the six years that Bernie spent with Marjorie, Bernie had transferred a minimum of $3 million from her account to his. The investigator claimed that Bernie faked multiple deposit slips so that it looked like he was putting money into her account when in fact he was taking it out. Bernie invested some of the money into a Western wear store in town, as well as in an aviation company at a local airport. It seemed as though Bernie forged some financial documents to make it seem as though his investments had turned a profit. His actions were described as a one-person Ponzi scheme. Oh, my God. The jury deliberated for four hours and announced that Bernie was resentenced to 99 years. He'll be eligible for parole in 2029 when he is 71. I, again, it's, for me, it's the fact that a, a woman was murdered, her body hidden for months, and the town was like, you know what? He's not such a bad guy when you get to know him. I mean, listen, it's it's a tough gray area, right? Because again, you know, I don't think we can defend most murders. Of um, course. We've, you know, we've referenced this before in the show where there's times where it's like, well, like the Lorena Bobbitt episode is a great example. Now she didn't kill him, of course. But again, it's like, right. it's one of those things where, yes, he was, you know, abusive to her and all of the above but again it's and and i do believe she could have disassociated at the time but again it's like there are other people who are abused who don't cut off their husband's penises right so again it's like this is another example where there are other people who've been abused and they don't kill somebody so it's it's like you can have yeah. compassion but also it's like i think it's a slippery slope if we start you know defending certain murders yes. there are murders that are legitimate self-defense there are some uh, which we wouldn't even call a murder there you, you know there's different kinds of killings but but this is a this is a tough one and when you add in that it turns out he stole so much money from her it's like mm -hmm. well now we're getting into something that's a little bit different now it's not necessarily as cut and dry as somebody having a mental episode it's it's yeah. um you know there's there's motive here there's a very strong motive here so Oh, a hundred percent. And, and I, I don't there's just, you, that, you know, charm is one of the top Ted Bundy, the Jeffrey Dahmer. Is, and I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying he's like a serial killer, but I'm just saying that it's like, it's not oh, abnormal yeah. for someone to be able to be exceptionally charming and also not necessarily yeah. have great intentions. That's very oh, possible. A hundred percent. Um, it should also be noted that, uh, Marjorie's family not a fan of the movie. I, I, I'm not surprised by that. Because, yeah, the movie absolutely paints him as this sweet, sweet man and her as just the worst human. Like, mean to everyone, just firing people, being racist, like, horrible. And well, then... and if I'm going to be honest with you too, the, the only other thing that I will say that, that bumped me a little bit was that it was, it does, there's a scotch for me of like, is this some misogyny here too? Like it's, I, I just, I don't know the fact that it was like, this guy is a prince and it was like, she's a mean old lady. It's like, I don't know them. I wasn't there, but it's just sure. one of those red flag alarms that goes off for me where it's like, I think it's very easy to paint um certain people in certain lights and yes also how much of this is what people witnessed versus what he told people because that's another factor too right like yeah the fact that she went through a period of time where she wasn't even seen in public um now granted i know that that was also because she was no longer with us but you know of what course. i mean like how much was he yeah how I much was he telling people like you'll never guess what she did today exactly yeah exactly. we don't know but i find it fascinating that every time he pushed back they just kept extending his sentence. It's pretty funny. And made it worse and worse. And I just don't even know. Yeah. But. Also, the only other thing I want to say, and listen, I don't yeah. even need to belabor this, but now we're into the true crime of it. And, and you know, I, 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 I'm putting on my lawyer hat for a of second. Of course. Oh, yes. I wonder what kind of hat my lawyer hat would be. I, <gasps> I mean, I feel like it would be very jazzy. But anyway. Oh, it has to um, be flashy, of course. 
and I and look, you don't you you don't know the answer to this, and and it could be that there was witnesses. But my other question is, and I we believe victims on this show. We believe women. We believe victims. Period. However, yes. I do find it interesting that this lawyer approached out of nowhere, saying that there was books on sexual abuse found in his home, and then it was like, oh yes, I was sexually abused. No, I didn't tell my lawyer, my previous lawyer, that. I just felt I don't know if if there was any documentation or other witnesses that could speak to his previous abuse only Not because I know of in a court of law, when we're yes. talking about the court of, when we're talking about the courts of laws, yes. Having books in a home does not prove that you were a victim of any crime that there is no, that yeah. does, that's not proof. Anyone can own a book about any topic. Yes. And that does not prove just as, you could have a book about a serial killer. I've got one right in front of me right now. That doesn't prove that I'm a serial killer. And of I would hope course. that, it, you know what I mean? So it's like, if I was on trial for something that I didn't do, for example, I wouldn't want that held against me. It's it's one of those things where it's like, yes, I just found that to be like an interesting, it's interesting to me that that was the thing that she, she bumped on and then they made a whole kind of appeal out of it. And then ultimately yeah. it didn't matter anyway. Um, and yeah. again, listen, I'm not saying he's lying. I'm just saying it was interesting to me as a legal strategy because to me, it's like, that doesn't prove anything. Well, especially when the first prosecutor was like, well, if I'd known that, it would have been right. a max 20 years. Right. And then he would have been out by now. And listen, is it possible that he was abused and he didn't share that with his lawyer because he was ashamed or he didn't think it was relevant? Sure. Of course that's possible. And again, I'm I'm not being glib. I'm merely stating it's convenient to then say like, oh, yes, I did have those books because I was abused. Yes, that is my story. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's. It's it's tough. And it's also hard for me to believe. And now, granted, we don't know what the nature of the relationship with that first lawyer was, but I feel like a lot right. of lawyers are going to go through absolutely every possibility in terms of defenses. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, mm. I don't know. Just just again, that was the only other thing I wanted to comment on because I just thought it was interesting only because it sets really weird legal precedents. And listen, they didn't win, so it doesn't. But if they had, it sends weird legal yes. precedents that it's like, if we find a book in your house on a topic, then that is proof that you then are connected to that topic. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I don't get it, but I also find it fascinating that somebody saw the movie and then went, hey, can I see the files? And how does that work? That's our and dream. I, We've been begging for this for years, for, for almost two years. I know. Let us I see assume the file. because she was like in within the law, but still I find it fascinating that well, it feels there like was Richard Linklater about was, it. was very connected to all of this and perhaps she went through him and he wanted to help. I don't know. It's possible. Well, I guess we're going to become friends with Richard Linklater. I guess we have to. If that's if that's our way into the police computer. Even if it's him talking to the cops, distracting them while we use the computer in a back office. What I love is the the scene that would would, would then take place, which is us going like, well, which do we look up first? We burn so much time yeah. on our own time. We need to make a list. We need, we need a list in advance Yep. because Richard can only hold the down the fort so long. He'll have to bring in Jack Black. And then my mind's out. I'm distracted. I'm like oh. peeking through the crack of the door, trying to watch him perform what I assume is a majestic routine. And I've written down list means. for police computers so we don't forget. And then also, I can't be left to my own devices in that moment. You're di you're distracted by Jack Black. Then I'm just yeah. Googling my ex-boyfriends. Then course. I'm just taking, I'm like, I need to know. Oh, I, I, ass I assume they would be on the top of the list anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I We want to know. We need to know. We need to know. We're just curious. Yeah. Uh, so, the third please and final movie yep. of true crime movie time true crime movie time you know i just love when things rhyme yep okay. and that rhymed with the doesn't matter yeah i like it a lot um it's a movie from 2019 it's called bad education oh not to be confused with the uk series because jack whitehall is in a TV series called Bad Education, not the same. Gotcha. This one uh, stars Hugh Jackman, Allison Janney, and Ray Romano. Again, spoiler alert, but basically, Hugh Jackman 
plays Frank Tassone, a beloved school superintendent who gets told that his second in command is embezzling money from the school district. The thing is, Frank already knew about it because he was also embezzling from the school district. Mm -hmm. So the real story behind it, Frank was a school superintendent for the Roslyn School District in New York. Frank was eloquent and charming and had a doctorate degree from Columbia University. He was well-liked by both students and parents, as he frequently ate lunch with the students and ran a book club for the parents. Frank's wife, Joanne, died from cancer in 1973, but two years later, Frank met Stephen Signorelli at a bar, and the two have been domestic partners ever since. In the movie, the character hides his sexuality from everyone in the school district, but the real Frank was upset by that added detail, saying he never once hid who he was. Frank admitted that when he first applied for the superintendent job, he told them he was a widower, which technically he was. But he applied for the job in 1992. So I'm surprised he told them he was a widower since he'd been in a relationship with Stephen for 17 years at that point. Yeah. But maybe a little sympathy to get the job? Who knows? Mm. Uh, the main point here is that Frank was very well liked by everyone and remained in the role as superintendent for 12 years, with no one realizing that Frank had spent 10 of those years embezzling from the school district. In what turned out to be the largest school embezzlement scandal in U.S. history. Wow. So Roslyn High School is located on the north shore of Long Island, about 24 miles or 39 kilometers east of Manhattan. It has just over a thousand students in grades nine through 12. Uh, it was in the top 10 national rankings of best public schools. And in April 2004, the Wall Street Journal ranked Roslyn the sixth best high school in America. In 2022, it is ranked 415 overall and the number 50 in the state of New York. For those who are curious, in 2022, the current number one high school in the United States is Thomas, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, huh. all right. I like to add the fun facts. I like that. Uh, so in the late 90s and early 2000s, Roslyn High School had a 95% graduation rate and parents were happy to see their children getting into Ivy League schools. Property values in the area increased, but no one wondered why this fairly wealthy school didn't even have enough money to fix its own leaky roof. In October 2002, a clerk noticed a man buying construction materials with a Roslyn School District credit card at a Home Depot in Selden, which is about 37 miles or 59 kilometers east of Roslyn. This stood out to the clerk because there are numerous Home Depot locations between Selden and Roslyn. The man was also having the materials delivered to an address 55 miles or 88 kilometers east of Roslyn. It turns out the man using the credit card was 40-year-old John McCormick, who had used the card to buy $85,000 worth of materials from various Home Depots throughout Long Island. Mr. McCormick owned a private contracting business, but was making the school district pay for all of his supplies because his mother was Pamela Gluckin, the assistant superintendent and business administrator for the Roslyn School District. In Bad Education, Pamela is played by one of my personal favorites, Allison Janney. Oh, of course. I love her so much. Uh, personally, even though I've never met her, and also just publicly for, you know, who she is. Uh, but the Home Depot clerk knew something was off, so she called the Roslyn School District, and the tip was investigated by the school's auditor, Andrew Miller, who reported his findings to Frank Tessone. Frank then went to the school board and told them their reputation would suffer if this matter was made public so they decided to handle it quietly. In February 2004, an anonymous letter was sent to the school board and the district attorney, claiming that both Pamela and Frank had been stealing money from the school. 
Rebecca Rombaum, the editor-in-chief of the Roslyn High School's newspaper, The Hilltop Beacon, decided to look into the matter and uncovered that Pamela Gluckin had been using the school's district's credit card for her own personal use to the tune of about $250,000. Whoa! Pamela was ostracized, and Frank pushed her to resign. He, of course, played innocent, had no idea. How could you do this, Pamela? Yeah. Frank told the board members he felt betrayed, just as betrayed as the rest of them, which was a lie because not only did he know about Pamela's dirty spending, Frank was also fully doing it as well. In the end, Frank was responsible for stealing $2.2 million from the school district. He paid for a Park Avenue apartment that he shared with his partner, Stephen, as well as the house in Vegas that he had recently purchased for his boyfriend, Jason. Oh, wow. Because what's a good scandal without some good tea? Even though Frank and Stephen had been a couple since 1975, 55-year-old Frank had recently started seeing 32-year-old uh, Jason, who was a bartender and former exotic dancer. When this all came to light, Frank claimed that Stephen knew about everything. They had an open marriage. Stephen has not spoken publicly Interesting. about it. Frank also spent money on first-class plane tickets, expensive suits, $1,800 a night hotel rooms, cars, cosmetic surgeries. He paid over $37,000 for dry cleaning, $56,000 for a weight loss doctor. And Pamela, it turns out, took far more than what people realized. Uh, she bought art, jewelry, a Jaguar, vacation homes in Florida and the Hamptons. In the end, it is estimated that Pamela stole about $4.3 million. Whoa! And while that is a lot of money, it turns out that over $11.2 million was actually missing because 29 other people, including 25 school officials, were all benefiting from the scheme. Pamela's niece, Deborah Regano, who worked as a district clerk, was accused of stealing more than $780,000. Frank's partner, Stephen, had taken almost $900,000. Of the more than $11 million, $1.5 million was not traceable to a specific individual. So they have no idea where that went. Uh, the Hilltop Beacons article about the embezzlement scandal ended up getting picked up nationwide and was part of the reason they got caught was a high school reporter. Only six district employees pleaded guilty to any wrongdoing, even though there was 25 of them. Uh, Pamela's son, John McCormick, faced a maximum of 15 years in prison, but was sentenced to five years probation and 100, year, 100 hours sorry, of community service. Pamela Gluckin pleaded guilty to first-degree grand larceny and was sentenced in September 2006 to three to nine years in prison. She was released in May 2011 and remained on probation until September 2015. She worked for a nonprofit in Queens and vowed to give half of her pension to the Roslyn School District every year. Because, yes, because of an oversight in state pension law, Pamela still received a $55,000 pension every year. God. Pamela passed away in 2017 at the age of 71. No cause of death has ever been released. Frank Tassoni, Tasson uh, pleaded guilty and agreed to pay back what he stole. In November 2006, Frank was sentenced to four to 12 years. He was released in 2010 for good behavior and remained on parole until 2018. He is forbidden from holding a job that requires him to handle money, and he currently lives a low-profile life in New York. And the real kicker, just like Pamela, Frank still receives a pension, but his is over $170,000 Oh annually. my God, that's criminal. Yeah, it's it's horrifying, but um, it's not much of one. I have created a small game. Fabulous. <laughs> I don't know if we need it, but it's there. Yeah, Look, because I have my usual list, but we'll we'll get to that. I thought we could do uh, the quick game off the top. Uh, I learned it from you, uh, so it's two word. 
uh, the category yep. is 90s crime movies. And I'm hoping some of these are, uh, they're probably all easy. I don't know. Because uh, again, this is my first time. But okay. 90s crime movies. Mm -hmm. The Dude. Oh, The Big Lebowski. Yes. <laughs> I believe this is one word, but I'm making it two. Wood chipper. Oh, uh, Fargo. Yes. Kaiser Soze. Usual suspects. Yes. Oh, this is pushing it. Iconic dancing. Hmm. Oh, Pulp Fiction. Yes. Colorful names. Hmm. Reservoir Dogs. Yes. Not Antonio. <laughs> Desperado? Oh no, that's that is it. That is it. That is Antonio. Yes, from Dust Till Dawn. Yes. So, uh, no, the box. Seven. Thank you. Lotion basket. Silence of the Lambs. Guy Ritchie. Uh, Snatch. No. Uh, but I mean, it probably lock, could be, but lock, stock and two smoking barrels. Yes. School reunion. Mm, oh, oh yeah. Gross point blank. Oh. Lawyer relative. Oh, the judge. No. Mm. Um, oh God. Do I give a, my cousin Vinny. There she goes. <laughs> And one more. Please. And I just want to point out, I was going to do 10. I pushed myself to 12 to do a, a number that wasn't divisible by five. Of course. One arm. Well, the drummer from Def Leppard, but that's not it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Ah. Do you need another one? Yeah. Harrison. Oh, God damn it. The Fugitive. Yes. That, which leads me to, The Fugitive was the top grossing crime movie in the 90s. Hey. It was released in 1993 and grossed over $368 million worldwide. It was number 32 on the list of top grossing movies of the 90s. Do you want to guess what was the number one grossing movie of the 90s? Well, I would say Titanic, but I believe that was 2000. Oh, and she's not giving me anything. Um, That's what she does. <laughs> the number one highest grossing movie of the 1990s. Any yes. genre. Any genre. I'm talking all of them. Passion of the Christ. Thank you for that. You should have gone with your gut. Titanic released December 1997. God damn it. It grossed over 2.2 billion worldwide. Like, hey, you did amazing on that list. Thank you. Um, and also, <laughs> because I've gotten so used to making a list on Patreon, no one has asked for this. Yep. No one ever asks for them. I nope. give what people don't ask for. I've decided to list my, my top movies that have crime listed as a genre on IMDb. Because I learned on IMDb, you can just browse genre. And I was like, that's not a crime movie. It says it's a crime movie. Um, and in honor of Lauren, out of my comfort zone, I give you my list of my top 21. There's no reason for it. And I love it. I it's love not. it so much. Uh, also, uh, it was hard. I couldn't start ranking them. So they are just going to be from oldest to newest. Great. Because that's easier. And I would like you to know it broke my heart that Kindergarten Cop didn't make the cut. Why didn't you just make it 22? Oh, fuck. See, this is what I don't <laughs> understand. This is a bigger conversation, though. It we is. can't do it this it now. It's too she's, much. She's broken. If you Anyhow. go to 21, you could go to 22. There's no rules. You're right. You're right. I just felt like one passed my, one felt pushing it. Two feels like greedy see and this know, is point is 
Okay. Well, in my heart, number 22 is kindergarten cop. Just know thank that. you. Thank you very much. Uh, number one, who framed Roger Rabbit? That's your number one. Oh, well, the, again, them. these are just in order, yep. but yep. but maybe. Wow. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, number two, Dick Tracy. Oh, yeah. You love that movie. I do. Number three, Point Break. Oh. Hackers. Mm. Uh, number five, Desperado. <laughs> number six, Bad Boys. What you gonna do? Yeah. Number seven, The Net. It's oh. just a giggle to see old computers now. Yep. Um, number eight, Face Off. Oh, yeah. Number nine, Con Air. Of course. Number 10, Ocean's Eleven. Mm. I, I don't know why I love that movie as much as I do. Clooney and Pitt. Did you hear That's that they're why. doing a reboot, Margot Robbie, and they just signed on Ryan Gosling? Well, you know I'm going to see that immediately. Of course. And just don't fuck it up. Have it be a nice combination of men and women and people. It doesn't have to be all one gender. Yeah. As the crew and make it work. Like Don't... Tim Gunn says, make it work. Just make it work. Uh, number 11, The Dark Knight. Oh, yeah. Number 12, Date Night. Cute. Number 13, Red. Oh, which yeah. is one of Bruce Willis's best, if I may. And John Malkovich shines and what i wouldn't give for helen mirren i fucking love her yeah uh, number 14 21 jump street love it. it makes me laugh number 15 we're the millers number 16 now you see me oh yeah i love that one number 17 r.i.p.d it's the most ridiculous concept of a movie but it charms me in a way i just can't yeah. describe i love that i feel the need to justify my own list you don't yeah, I know. Number 18, John Wick, which reminds me, I wanted to put speed in there, but they do not include speed with crime as a genre. And that's insane. It is, right? Yeah. But yet Twins is on what, there? What crime is happening in Twins? The crime of comedy? <laughs> Look, Arnold knocked it out of the park in the late 80s, early 90s. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Ah, uh, number 19, Keanu. Of course. Because that, God, that movie makes me laugh. Number 20, Kingsman, The Golden Circle. Mm -hmm. And number 21, Stuber. Oh, sure. Because what a delight. That movie surprised me and uh, was just a real delight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that. I also had to leave off like Miss Congeniality kills me weekend at bernie's like there's just so many but you know what it had to be done airheads was another one i almost added but i had to make cuts where i had to make cuts listen good for you for going to 21 it's like turning it to 11 yeah. um i'd also like to offer the following please Christy Oxborough had a dime for every single one of her rhymes. She'd be richer than Laura and Ash gets drunk on wine. It's true crime. Movie time. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why you don't have this as a service. You know what? Honestly, I would. I would. I. I mean, first of all, what an honor. What the a GD honor. The I, and look, if if the dear patrons ended up liking this, mm -hmm. yeah, look, there will be more true crime movie time in the future. Not just because it's fun to say. Uh, it's fun to research, especially when I'm like, oh, I got to watch this movie for work. Yeah. And then Jack Bach pops up on the screen and my husband goes, for work, huh? And I'm like, our work yeah well listen christy oxborough truly phenomenal first first installment of a true crime movie time i'm glad that i came up with the jingle by the end oh I, uh, love it. I loved this so much i'm glad that it was it was inspired by uh i love you to death i can't believe that it was so close to the real story because I, I always felt like it was so extreme right? but now knowing that it's very accurate makes it even mm -hmm. funnier to me especially um, them jumping around and going well which side is the hard on 
what side do you pledge allegiance? Well, we better do it so we can figure it out. Yeah. And they still got it wrong. Yeah. That feels written. Oh, yeah. But it's also, not. Keanu Reeves' haircut in that movie deserves its own shout out because I it know. is a disaster <laughs> in the best <laughs> I, way. I need to believe he did that himself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and thank you, dear patrons, for being here. We're so appreciative for your support here in the Schmammered shma tier on Patreon. Uh, it really does mean the world for uh, to us. It allows us to continue to create this batshit content that you all seem to uh, like to consume and we like to give. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Helen Mirren. Good night, Booit and Scary Booit. Booit and Scary. I cocked it up. It was close. Thanks. Oh, dear listeners, what a hoot and a half. We thank you so very much for joining us for this Taste of Patreon episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We hope you enjoyed it. And maybe if you've been on the fence about Patreon, this will push you over the edge to come join the party. Visit us, patreon.com slash truecrimeandcocktails for all of the information you need over there. And if you haven't already, give us a follow on the rest of the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives, and of course, the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out if you haven't already. Uh, and listen... We're going to be back next week with an all-new episode. That's right, on the next True Crime and Cocktails, House of Maxwell. That's right, Ghislaine Maxwell. I know that's probably not how we say that name, but I don't think she deserves my respect, so that's how I choose to say it. We're going to be back talking all of that, so get ready, buckle in, and we look forward to seeing you then. Lauren, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Well, yes, I do, Lauren. Wow, it really doesn't work for me to do this solo. Thank God for Christy. Am I right? Hey, on that note, good night, Christy Oxborough. We all love you.